We are so excited that you've joined us today. You're about to hear a message from our pastor, Mike McFadder, from the Crossing Worship Center. Please make sure you are following us on YouTube and Facebook. We pray that this message draws you closer to the Lord and encourages you. We're going to go to Luke chapter number 13. We're going to read five verses there. And it's a little quick story about Jesus. And he's talking to some people here about just some, uh, some Galileans and some Pilate and all the things that was going on around him. And then we're going to go to Ephesians 1 and 7. But first, Luke chapter number 13 and verse number 1. Are you there? Say amen. 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 It says, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, and Jesus answered and said to them, that's what we got to have. And Jesus answered and said to us, this is what we have to have. I've got a lot of friends, got a lot of psychologists out there in the world, a lot of people that can give you their opinion. But there's only one man that can give you the truth. And when he said, hey, I'm about to tell you something, listen up. Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? I love this about Jesus. Jesus brings the distinction to these people. I'll give you a little background on what he's talking about here in a second. He said, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all of the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent, it don't matter which level or side you end up on, Galilean. The one who doesn't think it's very bad or the one whose blood's been mingled with the sacrifice. I come to tell you, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those 18, this, 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 these people actually, something worse happened to them. These 18 of whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all of the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This morning my title is, There's Power in the Blood. There's Power in the in the blood, not just any blood, my blood can't help you. The blood of bullocks and goats in the Old Testament cannot do what the blood of Jesus did. The blood of Jesus is something special. It's something supernatural. It come out of the Son of God, and it was necessary for people like me and you to get redeemed out of a sinful life. The blood of Jesus had to be so powerful that it could set you free from alcoholism. <laughs> I said the blood of Jesus had to be so powerful that it could set an addict free <laughs> without having to go through 12 steps uh, or having to go through detox. I said the blood of Jesus can set a man free and you won't have to have all of the breakdown that you might have to go through. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus sings the same way every time, but I'm telling you, I can tell you this, the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can break the hold of sin in a man or woman's life. Without the blood of Jesus, the Bible says there is no remission or taking away of the sin. Somebody in the house say amen. So the blood of Jesus is the only thing powerful enough to deal with our problems. Ephesians 1 and 7, the Bible gets here and gets a little more specific, and I'm going to talk about it. It said, in him, in him we have redemption. Aren't you glad of that? But it's not just in him. It's not just because Jesus exists. He said, in him, through his blood. The only way you are forgiven this morning is Jesus shed his blood. For the wages of sin is death. Death had to come. It had to be just exactly what he said it was. He said, for the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. For in him we have redemption through his blood. You are not saved unless Jesus has applied the blood to your life. 
So you're saying to yourself, maybe some of you, I don't know that I understand that. Well, the Bible actually said there was a lot of them that didn't understand that the blood he's talking about doesn't necessarily apply in your natural life. It applied to your spiritual life. Come on, somebody. I'm here to talk to saved people. I'm here to talk to people that have been saved a long time. I'm not here just talking to people that don't know Jesus. I'm here talking to myself. I ain't this. I'm going to tell you something. The blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin will follow you all the way to heaven. You're going to need it before you get to heaven. You're going to need to know that the blood of Jesus and what it does, because if you don't know, listen to me, the results of sin are going to leave you in the same place it did before you knew Jesus. Sin is sin, brothers and sisters, and sin don't change what it does. You say, well, I'm saved. Then we need to have the blood of Jesus to do for us what nothing else can do. You know, there's a part in place we have to understand and know that we're not all perfect yet. One day we'll be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, brother, we're going to be changed for the last time. We've been changed multiple times. I've asked God to change me many times. There's things that I've went through that I didn't know I was going to have to go through. There's times I slipped on the Lord. Anybody ever slipped? <laughs> Come on, the Bible says he can help you put your foot where you want to. But sometimes when you're not looking at Jesus, you can slip. Uh -huh. Your flesh will help you slip, won't it? Somebody tell me you know who you are. So I know who I am. Oh, yeah. And Jesus said the blood is the reason we must have that power. Matthew 26 and 28. You see, if we don't understand what sin is, we can never appreciate the blood. For this is my blood of the what? I'm talking about new covenant preaching. I'm talking about the New Testament. The blood of Jesus, this is my covenant. Without the blood, there's no covenant with the Father. A covenant is that stamp that says, I'm in a covenant with you. It's your marriage license to Jesus. Come on, it's where the thumbprint of God said, this one belongs to me. <laughs> and he didn't stamp it with somebody's pen or the blood of a goat. He dipped over there and stuck his finger in the blood of his son Jesus and put it on you and said, this means you belong to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when we have this, we know that it's my blood for the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin or the taking away. Now let me ask you, saints. I know about sinners, but let me ask you, saints. When you sin, does it hang out with you? Uh, when you do something you shouldn't do, how long does that last? Is that just a quick act? Get, get in and get out. No, no, it seems like it's like a coat. It like it gets on top of you. It just puts itself in hooks in you. It's like putting a hook back in you. It just gets a hold of you. And before long, you're feeling worse than you did before you got saved. Now, the only reason we got saved is conviction had to come. Without conviction, nobody comes to Jesus. The Spirit has to draw you. But I'm going to tell you something that I heard this week. I'm telling you, it's so powerful that I just said, my Lord, without the preaching of the law, nobody would ever know they had sinned. Paul said we have to preach enough law to make a man know that he had not covet. You can't covet your neighbor's boss. You can't covet your neighbor's boat. You can't covet your neighbor's house. You can't covet your neighbor's wife. You can't cover your neighbor. Why is that? Because covetousness is not of God. That's in the ten top list. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. How do we know that? Because the law said don't put anything else before God. Don't raise up any graven images. That means don't have you something out there that you think is more important than God. Come on, Americans. Now, this, don't, this might not fit in Ethiopia or in some third world country where they don't have nothing. But when we're driving $65,000, $75,000 cars, living in $300 houses, folks, come on now. you let something get ahead of God if you're not careful. But you wouldn't even know that God cared had he not given us the law. Thou shalt not lie. Hmm? Bear false witness. You know them little white ones we now tolerate. 
You know what I'm saying? Come on. You get under enough pressure, you lie. Bible says all liars should have their place in the lake of fire. Woo! <laughs> oh, how many of that does that cover here? <laughs> all liars going to go to hell. But you better hope the blood of Jesus is what it says it is. I'm just trying to bring us to something this morning before I talk about the power that's in the blood. We have to know that there's power in sin as well. Before I can talk about the power of the blood, I have to talk about the power of sin. We can't just talk about being set free from something we don't even worry about. Come on, church. I'm not talking to lost people. I'm talking about saved people. I'm talking about people that if you're not careful, you'll take in something, start believing something about sin that's not true. <laughs> if, you don't, if you think sin's okay, you have having a different opinion than God does. Your opinion of sins, if it's okay, I'm telling you, it's absolutely diametrically opposed to what God said. God hates sin. That's what he said. It's every sin. I died for every sin, past, present, and future. The penalty for sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus, and it is there for the receiving. But there is no blood. If you don't believe that you have sinned, then there can be no cure. The Bible said, I didn't come to save the sick. I reckon for a man that knows, I mean, the well, I've come to look for a man that's sick. I need to know if you feel the way you do, then my blood can do something about it. If we have got to the place, if we begin to think in our modern day world where we just preach that sin doesn't have a result, I think we've lied to ourselves. <laughs> How do I know that? Because I know after pastoring this church and trying to be a man that I love God, every time I sin, feel just like I did the first day I sinned. Thank God for it. I remember, I remember a time in my life, brother, when I could sin didn't bother me too bad. Oh, <laughs> uh, y'all aren't going to help me preach. That's all right. That, that's all right. I understand. I understand. I'm going to do it anyway. I, I remember I heard, I heard somebody say, oh, somebody said, hear my family. I want my family to hear me. I started preparing this message about a week and a half ago. I didn't preach last week, and the Holy Ghost got in there on me. I'm telling you, I had some things going on. And I, and, I, and I remember seeing this little caption by a man of God, and he said, when you start to preach the blood of Jesus, he said, expect the greatest attack you've ever had. Come on, baby. Oh, I stopped and I looked around my room. I looked around and I didn't see nothing, Brother Josh. I, I actually said to myself, Brother, I don't see no problems. I don't see no problems. But I want to tell you something, wasn't just a few days later <laughs> that the enemy showed up in great force. Well, you know why he's mad at you. Let me tell you why he's mad at me. He don't want me to tell you this morning that the blood of Jesus has the power to set you free. The blood of Jesus has the power to touch your mind this morning. Only the blood of Jesus can save you. Only the blood of Jesus can help you. And it's the, only the blood of Jesus that he fears. I'd fight it too, wouldn't you? And that's all right, so we're going to find out. Understand this about sin. I'm talking again to the believer. If, if you have unrepented sin in your life, it's going to create a fear. It's going to create fear in your life. Fear is not of God. It's going to break fellowship with God. Sin breaks fellowship with God. You say, oh, no, no, I've got the blood of Jesus. I'm not talking about every time you sin, you've got to get saved again. I am saying if you sin, there should be some feeling with it. There has to be because God hates sin. Sin has to come. Sin, when it comes, it comes with bondage. I'm telling you, if you don't get unrepented sin repented over, you are going to end up in bondage to whatever that sin is. Now, it can be the sin of unbelief. You're going to be a doubt-ridden person if you don't get that under the, under the blood. Come on, somebody. 
Somebody this morning, hear me this morning. If you have something in your life that is not where it needs to be with God, then the blood of Jesus is there to break that hold. It's there to forgive you and take that blood away. But you have to repent of your sin. If you don't all likewise repent, he says you shall all likewise perish. Now in that scripture that I read, he actually was talking to people that were treating sin in different categories. So he says, do you think one Galilean sin was worse than the other? Well, yeah, because the towers fell on them. Their sin must have been worse than the one I did. Come on. Come on. Come on, Pentecostals. Come on, Pentecostals. Help me preach this morning. Come on, all of you. That, all of you. All of you that hates homosexuality. Come on. Help me preach a little bit here about unfaithfulness. Come on. <laughs> oh, see, you're going to get quiet on me. I want you to shout me down. Not when I'm just saying that, the, that there's homosexuality in this world. When there's, a, when there's people that are unfaithful to God, let's shout and say that's true too. Let's say when sometime we're getting cold in the Lord. The indifference comes when sin, listen to me, the problem with unrepented sin is it creates an indifference to you about the sin. After a while, you won't care. That's what happens when sin lingers. Unrepented sin will eventually become okay with you. And you're going to have your pet sins. I've been through this. You pastor, you're going to go through this. Everybody sees somebody else's sin worse than theirs. I'm going to drink while you say amen. <laughs> Come on. You know they'll stone you over yours. Bible says you need to check that beam out in your eye before you start talking about the speck. Come on, church. You know what I'm saying. You understand. That's what Jesus was saying. But what he's really saying is this, and please hear me. Please hear this point. To God, there is no difference in sin. You do not have to do anything to go to hell. You come in this world a sinner. For all have sinned. And the only way out of that is to accept Jesus Christ, what he did on an old rugged cross, and to believe that your sin put him there. Not your neighbor. You want to find a good, solid Christian. You find somebody that realized what they did. We're all ready to point a finger at what somebody else did. I'm going to tell you something. The only people that's repenting over sin are people that's had a new nature. I'm going to say it again. The only person that's repenting over sin is people that care about that nature. You see, if I don't have that new nature of Jesus Christ, I won't repent. Because when I didn't care, I didn't worry about what I did. I might not have wanted to get caught, but I sure wasn't trying to get out of it. You couldn't convince me in my house that I couldn't look at pornography. As long as you caught me, I might feel a little guilt. <laughs> we all like to feel a little guilt when we get caught. I'm not talking about that crowd. I'm talking about the crowd that finds out that the Holy Ghost is in the house. Come on, somebody, that you've been changed by a new nature. You have a new nature. Listen to me. Listen to me. People that sin doesn't mean that you're not saved. What happens is people that sin have to go repent. That's what the new knowledge does. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about fighting through depression and anxiety and guilt and frustration. Because why? I don't know why I feel like a sheep killing dog. I can tell you why. There's unrepented sin. And it's going to kill you and put you in bondage in your mind if you don't simply ask for Jesus to do what he said he would do. Let the blood cleanse you. Man. Amen. Broken fellowship with God aches that heart of a believer. There's times if I don't, if I'm not in right fellowship with God, I am a miserable person to be around. <laughs> oh, somebody saved. Tell me, say amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 8. I said, when we, there is a new nature in me and you. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, Paul talking to the church, I do not regret it. Sometimes the preaching has to get in your business. 
<laughs> I know, I'm the preacher. I got, he said, I do not regret it, though I did regret it because I don't want to have to lose friends. I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Come on, hear me, somebody. Paul said, I brought the message to you and it bothered you on Sunday, but you lost that bother on Monday. Yeah, come on. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's one reason I don't go to church. Every time I go down there, it makes me feel bad. Nothing about your spiritual man feels bad. No, 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 nothing today. I'm not talking. Your spirit man's hoping I preach it right straight down the line. He's being tired of being shoved into drinking. He's tired of being shoved into lying and pornography. He's tired of being set with people in places that there ain't no God. Some of us need to look at our life and say, my God, where are we at? This is not where Christianity should be. He said, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry. I'm not glad you feel sorry. He said, but that your sorrow led you to what? There are a lot of people sorry. There are a lot of folks got sorry, got caught. Yeah, help me somebody. I said they got caught. That's why we felt sorry for that, man. We was riding high. Come on, we had our flesh appeased, and now we can go to church. Wouldn't you like to go to a church where you can have your flesh and your spirit? That's what they're producing. That's what's happening across this world. We're not preaching to the sin because the people sitting in the pew are say, look at here, you're not telling me about my sin. What about your sin? I'm the pastor that'll tell you. I the message come out of my sin. I'm here to tell you, I messed up, messed up with God. I was laying down in that bed, brother. He woke me up, Roy. If I don't wake you up sometime, tell you what you got to do. You're going to find out, sir. He said, you're not leaving this sin alone. No, sir, you're not going to bed, put your head down, act like nothing happened. You're going to, I'm coming to you, Mike, because I love you. I'm going to deal with you because I love you. I'm not going to let you do this. And I'm telling you, the felt, that, that gnawing, feeling of guilt and condemnation. Oh, my God, I had to get up and crawl in that bedroom, knelt down by that bed. Oh, I just, oh, gee. I'm telling you, when you're not where you need to be, you can't pray. Uh, yeah, them tongues don't come out. <laughs> you just don't even know. I don't even know if I can look at God. <laughs> I know sometimes. You want to know why I do that? Because I've been changed. Other than that, baby, I'm marching on. There's a group of people in this world that have no problem living with the fear of sin. I said fear comes with sin. People fear. They don't like it. They don't like to feel that. But they have not repented. To simply be sorry is not to repent. Repentance, folks, is a total t total change. It means I'm now going to stop this and go that way. Help me preach. I said the repentance, we have to know what repentance is. He said, I'm not, I'm not talking about if, if sorrow does not lead you to repentance. For you were made sorrow, sorry in a godly manner. Listen, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. In other words, I don't want you to lose anything. Let it deal with you. For godly sorrow produces repentance. That leads to salvation. But there's an opposite. Not to be regretted, but sorrow of the world produces death. To simply be sorry you did it and feel bad is not enough with God. I said no one, listen to me church, and apply it to your life. No one can act outside of their nature for very long. I said, nobody, nothing can act outside of its nature for very long. I have got me a black lab. Oh, y'all saying, boy, that's nice. I <laughs> know. No, he, yeah, he's nice. He's a good boy. <laughs> he's a good boy. And I'm telling you, he, d he dug a hole in my backyard. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I, 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 had a little, I got a lawn more. You could have put it in. He, listen, he got in the hole. You can't see him. He come out, had a little dirt on top of his head. Looked at me. I went out there. I said, no, no. He looked at me. And I, years went back. And in a few minutes, he wagged his tail to see if I'd give up. And he went and got his little face, that little wiggy we call it. We throw people. He went and got his wiggy. He, just for a second did he feel bad about it. 
And then he went right back to being what? A dog that digs. I said nothing acts outside of its nature for very long. Not even people who claim to be a Christian. Eventually, their old nature, if you're not totally changed, will surface again. You tell me how many times it's happened. How many times has it happened? Somebody get in, man, they got, um, but look, they so, they so, I've had them cry on my shoulder, wet my jacket. Oh, I got things in my life, Brother Mike. I am sorry. God, I'm so sorry. And I just, oh, you want to repent? Yes, I'll repent. No, no, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry. So praise God. Now the blood of Jesus, wash that away. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Monday, come that old heat of the desert starts hitting hard. Poor long old Michelob looking pretty good. <laughs> you know how we do. I deserve me a cup of beers. <laughs> yeah, somebody, you just don't know what kind of stress I'm under, preacher. Oh, the stress coming back in my life. I've had people tell me, oh, I got saved. Oh, it's all hell broke loose. Every time I get saved, something happened to my truck. Every time, something, just, every, time every time I got saved, something happened to my, I don't have no money. Every time I got saved, I got saved. I thought you were going to tell me, Pastor, we got saved. Money, we're going to roll in. I, now I'm more broke than I've ever been. I don't know what to do. I had plenty of money to buy them 24 packs, but I, I ain't got enough money to tithe now. I just ain't got nothing. But I found me a way to buy me some of them old Marlboros, <laughs> about six dollars a packet, but I don't know if I can tithe. I'm not sure if I believe in tithing. I, you know, I, I found me a way to tithe. You know, they find a good movie down there. I think me and the family will go. Hallelujah. Me and them going to go. It's a nice little movie. No problem with movie. Pastor's not preaching against movie. But I'm here to tell you, you spend your money on what you want to. I know when I was lost, sinner, I didn't have no problem. I said, my God, let me find me a little bit. I'd have dug up under the seat, dug up. I said, I got to have me some money. I need me a drink. Come on, church. Get in church. Can't got nothing. I got no money to tithe. We just broke. You ain't broke. You are struck out on your flesh. We got more than we've ever had. Turn me off if you want to. That's what that flesh will do. Turn that preacher off. Hallelujah. But your spirit says, hey, man's telling me the truth. I know nothing acts outside of its nature for very long. I might sin, but my nature will put me back at the altar. I might do something wrong, but I promise you, Mikey will come crawling through that door before too long. Well, you're patting yourself on the back. No, sir, I'm telling you what the blood of Jesus does. The blood of Jesus says you can't live with this sin in your life. I'm not going to let you live here like that. I observe the very things, he said, that you sorrow in a godly manner. What diligence is it produced in you? Huh? That's what he said. What has your sorrow produced? Has it done anything for you to change? We leave out of here, go right back to what we were. That's not repentance. He said, what clearing of yourselves what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all these things, you prove yourself to be clear in this manner. That's what he said. You should not, listen, this is Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, they actually had to see the blood. You know, I said it's a spiritual thing. I wonder if it was in the natural what I'd look like this morning. Would I be just pouring blood? You'd be going, oh, God. I just must have lived a bad life this week. I said, you don't know nothing about my life. I don't know nothing about yours. I just know who I am as you. And I don't care if you're saved or lost. Until we get home, we're going to have to deal with sin. And if sin don't bother you, your opinion of sin is different than God's. Now, if you got the nature of Jesus, sin should bother you. 
And if it don't bother you, you've gone and got cold. That's what unrepented sin does. Brings back a cold, indifferent person. It makes you not care. Stay with it too long, you won't care. You know and I know. It won't be long, you'll be, you'll be <coughs> skipping church and getting out. Won't nobody be able to talk to nobody. You, you, all, now you know how that gets. You text them, they was all doing good about a month ago, and I can't get them to answer me. Come on, help me, somebody. You know what I'm saying. The only way in this thing is a Christian has to go and deal with that sin. That's what it is. But nothing acts outside of its nature. So even if you're a sinner, you might come to church and dabble around a little bit, but if you don't truly repent, and I'm telling you, sorrowful has to go to hatred. If you don't hate something, you'll go back. You have to hate it. You can't say, I don't like that, and then look. The devil saw you look. A girl, sober for years, came to me one day at church. She had been through programs. She'd gotten sober, gotten saved. She came to me. She, she's crying. I said, what's wrong? She just cried. I said, what's wrong? She said, I, 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 I did something. I said, what would you do? She said, I knew she was, trying, you know, she was a, you know, they say recovering alcoholic, whatever that is. I'm just saying she, was, she had gotten set free from the bondage of alcohol. And she said, I, I went to a party. And she said, before I knew it, I had reached and took that drink. She said, when I reached for it, I pulled my hand back. I told her, I said, whoa. See, the Bible says, man will say to himself, I haven't slept with that woman. But Jesus said, if you've looked upon that woman. That's why he says it that way. Because a man will give us a pass. He'll get himself a pass. See, right there, he's justifying his sin. Well, I didn't, 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 I didn't. Hey, look, I didn't. Hey, come on now, grace, preacher, grace, preacher. That's what it is. Jesus said, unless you repent, there is no grace. If repentance doesn't take you to a changed life, you can't say unchanged, folks. We can't live like we used to live. I'm a new creature. I can't be the same old guy. I'm not saying I don't sin, but I'm telling you, the new nature changes who I am. My reaction to sin has changed. You know what I'm saying. Now, look what they said in Deuteronomy. This is what they did when the blood and the gore of the Old Testament sacrifice, when they'd have to cut those, those, those animals up, it was so much blood. There was over a million people. Can you imagine the blood at the altar? You mean this clean piece of mahogany? Yeah, that's what the modern church has made it. It did the same thing in the Old Testament. God said to him, you shall not plant yourself any trees or a wooden image near that altar. What they would do is they would go get the trees and plant them next to the bloody altar trying to, to soften trying to soften what it feels like to go down there and ah, 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 ah. what is that? That's that goat you're dragging down there. Ah, 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 ah. Stick him. Ah, yeah. You imagine all that going on all day long? Them little doves. Got that little brown eye looking at you. <laughs> him in pieces. Big old bullocks and ox. My God, who can stand that? What are you bringing that up here for? Sin, brother. Without the blood, there's no remission of sin. You say something had to die. That, that ox got to die. Why? Because you slept with your neighbor. Don't you understand I hate that? Don't you understand I hate sin? Something will give up its life for every sin committed. I don't care if it's a big one or a little one. God said I tolerate no sin. Something will have to bleed to get the sin out of the way. And they would plant them big tree so they could look at it. God said, cut that tree down. You know why he don't want you to glorify that altar? 
You make sin mean nothing, and you will never respect what Jesus did for you. If what you did is horrible and terrible and nasty and it's defied who you say, you, if it will make you, my God, did I do that? Did I do that to Jesus? What it does is creates in you a love and a respect for Jesus that cannot come any other way. I'm here to tell you that the church that's preaching this kind of sacrifice that costs a man nothing, he's found out that the church will go apathetic, the church will go lethargic it don't care anymore and that's how we got sin in the church because the cross became something we wore around our neck it became something we glorified in rather than a death symbol to everything we've ever done if what you did will make you feel horrible you'll know that Jesus blood will make you feel wonderful but if you never Feel nothing about your sin. I don't care nothing about Jesus dying. What does that mean? That's the way church is. Modern church this day. They take the cross. They ain't gonna talk about. The, we're not talking about the blood. They told us in all these other, all these conferences. They changed. We we'll talk about the blood. I said, folks, you don't talk about the blood. You ain't. There's no remission of sin. You don't feel bad. You got the problem. It's made to feel bad. That's what it's there for. Now, I can't preach about the blood of Jesus having power if you don't first say there's power in my sin. You dabble in it, you'll be addicted to it. I don't care if it's lying or pornography. If you get used to not coming here, it one day won't bother you. But that first time, you don't think I'm going to go. That first time. I'm not saying you have to be here all the time. I'm not saying every time you come here it's not sin. I'm just trying to say the system has taken us. I'm telling you what they told me in the last conference or the last counseling thing I had about church. They said the local small church will be consumed by the mega church. We're all going to go down to the biggest church in town. Whoever that preacher and pastor is, and God help us if he tells us the truth. I'm telling you what they told me. Your church ain't going to last in this climate. Why? It's going to be consumed by the big time preaching that says there's no problem. You're down there preaching blood and gore and they're preaching houses and cars. And you tell me where they want to go. You're preaching get out of your sin and they're having a little toddy on New Year's Eve. You tell me where your flesh wants to go. They're saying it's all right to sleep with your neighbor. And God said if you look on a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery in your spirit. You need to get right with God. And the only thing that will get you right with God is the blood of Jesus. What should a message like this do? It should bring us to a place of fear or hate, but one or the other. It ought to bring us to fear or hate. Because if I know, listen to me, I know. Up here, look at me. I know how sin feels. And when I'm half backslid or backslid, it don't matter. But when I transgress the law, The Bible says blood has to be shed. I've gone a little long. I'm going to close in five minutes to do that. Hebrews 9 says the blood of Jesus is necessary. It is powerful. Therefore, not even the first covenant, which was dedicated without blood. See, the first covenant. That don't have, when Moses had spoken in every precept and all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop. I'm telling you, this was a whole big deal. And he said he sprinkled that blood on the book itself and on all the people. I mean, you're left looking like a mess. 
saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. <laughs> then likewise, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Come on, folks, you just got to see me here for a second, taking the blood of them goats and slinging over here. And don't wear your new dress to church. Somebody said, well, if I don't wear your new clothes down there, somebody going to slang blood on you. Don't get to gun, get, God, what's that all over your face? How's that blood that preacher slung around this morning? I thought, my God, what church do you go to? The church of God's church. According to the law, almost all things are purified with the blood, but without the shedding of blood, there is no. Remission means take away. You know why this morning you are saved? Because Jesus' blood took your sin away from you. So the blood of Jesus makes you have acceptance to God. Revelations 1 and 5, I've already read this. I think the blood is a cleansing agent. The blood of Jesus is a cleansing agent. And from the Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, I said the rulers of the kings of the earth, to whom who he uh, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins and his own blood. When you accepted Jesus, the, the visual of that blood of Jesus just washed you, just washed you, took all of that out of your life. But only the blood of Jesus could have done it. You say, well, that, that, just, that just does seem so gory. It just, that's, that's what sin does. It should look glory, gory. Ephesians 1. The blood cleanses us. Now the blood is what accepts us and makes us redeemed. Ephesians says, to the praise of glory of His grace, by which He made us acceptable in the beloved. Now I know you think you got there because you went to church, or because you made a little prayer, or because maybe you said something. I want you to know, He said, that's not how you got there. For in Him we have redemption through His blood. If there is no bloodshed, the church is not redeemed. Come on, church. Without Jesus dying on an old rugged cross and the blood flowing off of that cross, and that blood has to stay relevant in our lives. We don't have redemption. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. Listen, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of His grace. Hallelujah. Two more quick. First John 1. To be able to live in the light. Now listen, I'm going to run these together and we're going to stand. He said, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light. <laughs> that's how you have fellowship with God. And he said, that's how you have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it as loud as I can say it with as clear as I can say it. If you stay in the light with Jesus and you have a sin, that blood of Jesus is cleansing you right then. The blood of Jesus begins to deal with that sin, that agent that comes into your body. If you take something in, the blood of Jesus, the blood will take over. The blood in your body is where the life is. Pour that blood out, there'll be no life in that body. The blood is where the life is. And that blood of Jesus will come. He said, if I say I have no sin, I've deceived myself. That's the worst kind of deception. I'm telling you, you can't break it. A man's deceived of himself cannot be broke, brother. It's only when we see ourselves, only through that, that conviction does a man ever move from fear to hate. As long as he's just afraid of how he's going to feel, he'll never go to hate. But once you've been through that enough, and you'll say next time, my God, I don't want to go through that again. I'm not doing that. I hate the way I feel. I hate the way I feel. And if that happens, he said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. He said, if we confess our sins. See that big old word? That big old if? Well, that's back when I first got saved. No, this book's written to redeem people. This book's written to redeem people. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you. I didn't care which one it is. God don't ask you to do more forgiving over, over adultery than he does lying. It's the same act, the same blood, the same results. He said, and just, the faithful and just, he's just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what he's willing to do with his blood. That's what he said. 1 John 2 and 1, and I'm going to close. My little children, these things I write to you 
so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus, the one that shed the blood, he's the one that's righteous. A righteous man died on a terrible cross for unrighteous people. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to follow us on YouTube and Facebook so you don't miss out on any future content from the Crossing Worship Center. Thank you again, and God bless.